Well, good morning. There's one announcement that Jerry didn't make because nobody told him, so he's forgiven. Uh, the David Strata family, David and Katie, they're all down sick, so keep them in your prayers as well. Um, and that's that. So, all right. So a word that'll make you maybe imagine, maybe think about things for a minute. The word is captivity. Now some of you may be real innocent and start thinking about the zoo. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people keeping people captive. About a week and a half ago I was just going through the TV and I found this uh, movie. It's one of those black and white things that just looks strange, it looked too pristine, too clean. Excuse me, it was color, but at times it got black and white. And it was a movie about um, the Jews and their concentration camps in Germany. The thing that struck me was the floors were immaculate. Everything just looked great. It was like, you know, nice place to visit. Wouldn't want to live there. But I thought, this isn't quite right. I can't believe for one minute that the, ca the concentration camps that they lived in were clean and pristine and nice and pretty and <sighs> invite your aunt over, that kind of thing. Captivity is something to us that just wrinkles and wrinkles our skin. Um, I don't believe for one minute if, in, in this day and age if somebody came in here now and tried, not here, but our country, and tried to take us captive, I don't think it would happen. And I think everybody knows that. We have a tremendous respect for freedom. We love freedom and we would defend it. But when I watched this movie, it just struck me as these people were stuck, and they really were. It's difficult to imagine what it would be like, but imagine for a minute that you know firsthand that the God of the universe, the creator of all things, the provider of a beautiful land to live in, plenty of food, and you turn your back on him. That was the children of Israel. He chose these people. He guided these people. He loved these people. They were to be the conduit, if you will, that would bring the Messiah, the Jews. And after years and no centuries of warnings of their sinful behavior, God finally gave up. Not entirely, but just gave up preaching, if you will. He told Israel they would be taken into captivity, predicted it in a prophecy. And they just shrugged. Eh, big deal. So eventually, God shrugged right back, and off to captivity they went. I can't imagine what they were thinking, because they were God's children. They were living in Jerusalem. Everything was pretty cool. They certainly weren't following God's laws. And now they were on the road into captivity. Their connection to God was damaged spiritually, of course, but physically as well. The temple was destroyed, and much of the religious practices and requirements ceased. So what do you do? How is faith reestablished? When we lived in Minnesota, there was a radio commentator there named Joe Souchere. I just happened to find a show one day, fell in love with it. It was just so funny. He, the show's name was Garage Logic. And if that kind of hits you, that's what it was. You're in your garage, and just talk about things, and be logical about it. I loved it. Something that in, uh, it was all about common sense, any subject, something that in Joe's opinion was sorely lacking in most Minnesota government functions. Joe had a favorite saying, whenever he'd come up on a problem, or there was a problem that seemed insurmountable, he wouldn't steam about it, he just said, I need to make a move. You need to make a move. You need to change things. Find the solution and act on the solution. And over time, that is what God did. His move would release the captives so they could return to Jerusalem, begin the rebuilding of the previously destroyed temple, and provide the way for spiritual renewal. So enter Cyrus in Ezra chapter 1, and we'll be studying out of Ezra uh, almost entirely this morning. Ezra was the king of Persia. Iris, uh, 
Cyrus states that God appointed him to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Cyrus then invites any who want to leave to work on the temple to do so, and about 50,000 go. We're out. We're going back. Yeah, we're going to be working, but we're out of captivity. A few stayed back, but these people that went, about 50,000, they settled in their old towns and in Jerusalem. And soon it was time to rebuild, but things didn't go well. Uh, enemies of Judah and Benjamin, the tribes, offered to help, but they were, they were refused because the people that had come out had said, well, Cyrus said that we were to build it. And they wanted to follow what Cyrus had said. It didn't go well with the enemies, so they started discouraging the Jews, making them afraid to work. They hired counselors to work against them and frustrate them. They wrote letters to the king. In fact, their letter campaign lasted through three kings. Each time they were turned down. Except for a temporary cease and desist order, Jews never stopped working, and through the persecution and trials they may have encountered, they marched forward. God had started this return of the Jews by making his move. Listen to Ezra 1.1, which is very similar to the what I started this little section off with. In the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord, spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, the king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. God made a move. He moved Cyrus's heart. So they let people go so they could rebuild the temple. Isaiah says about the Lord and Cyrus, He is my shepherd. He will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. God holds the right hand of Cyrus as he subdues nations. God had a need for Cyrus. And he moved his heart. And Cyrus, as it turns out, there's a lot of detail in, in the Ezra. He was the greatest benefactor to Israel one could ever see. What, you're going you're gonna to go, you're going to need some stuff. And if you'll remember the scene back in uh, Egypt days, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt and all the Egyptians were in favor toward them because God made them that way and just started giving them everything they could. Hey, I got a pair of tennis shoes here. I got an old turkey. Uh, you know, you want this? I got a kayak, a, a basketball. They couldn't give them enough. And that's kind of what was happening here. What do you guys need? And it all went with them. So they could buy material, food, housing, whatever they needed. The physical aspect then was pretty much done. The temple was rebuilt, but something was missing, and it was the spiritual. The spiritual side. They had the buildings to look at. But they'd forgotten. It'd been a lot of years. It wasn't like five years in prison, it was more like a hundred. Many people probably died in captivity. And so the ones coming out may not even know what it was like when Jerusalem was at its peak. About 80 years had passed and God made his next move. A leader, a leader, a Levite priest, well respected by God and man and kings. His name was Ezra. Ezra was 16 times removed from Aaron, Aaron being the high priest, first one for the Jews. His pedigree was intact then. Ezra was born while his parents were in captivity. He never knew the glory of Jerusalem, of the temple. He knew the history by word of mouth, no doubt, but also Ezra was a man of the world. word. He was a student. It was a passion for him. Ezra 7.10 tells us this. He set his heart to study the law. The phrase, set his heart, should not be glossed over. We're back in 7, verse 10. Other translations use the word devoted, prepared his heart, determined, firmly resolved. But there's something about setting your heart. This is what I really want. I want to do what I'm doing. He had commitment. And that's what we should see here. He was committed to study God's law, God's word. Not forced. He took it on himself. Well, I remember high school days those of us that went to high school. Um, if you had a class and you wanted to learn, you learned. But if you had a class like me, art, 
teacher was nice and gave me a D. I didn't care about art, except now my daughter, turns out she can draw like a crazy person. My granddaughter, I'm thinking, where'd that come from? Must have been there. So, <laughs> wasn't for me. The commitment, though, is what we should see. As a scribe, that's what he was called, he probably made copies of Bible scrolls. Imagine for a minute taking your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, start copying. Oh, with a pencil. Oh, not a pencil. A sharp thing they call a pen that you had to dip in ink and then make a little squiggly. And do that for those five books. He didn't get it done by three o'clock that afternoon. He was a scribe. He wrote things down. Well, what happens when you write things down and you stay in them and you do it again and again and you study? All of a sudden, you start to know it. You start to know it. The wind for Ezra, constantly being exposed to the words, he had time to reflect on what was being said, and we should all know that good study takes time, it takes effort to understand some passages, especially when one might need to be looking at other passages as well. With the commitment Ezra had, he gained insight to all the law, probably had most of it memorized and was considered well-versed in it. He set his heart to, and I'm not repeating, and I'm not an English teacher, however, the sentence is set up to show us things that Ezra does things because of his heart being set. He set his heart on studying. He set his heart to observe the law. In other words, to obey the law. And finally, he set his heart to teach the laws and decrees of God to Israel. It was preparation, a growth process. And this end result didn't go unnoticed. It was King Artaxerxes who recruited Ezra to make a second trip to Jerusalem with the balance of the captives. And oh yeah, in verse 9, it's always good to have this. For the good hand of his God was on him. And he asked the question, why? Because of his youth? Because of his captivity? No, because he had set his heart. He had set his heart on studying, learning, obeying, and teaching. Think about commitment to things. Think about things we do. In 10th grade, cross-country team, they all went out in, well, basically in May, started running for the fall to get in shape. I decided in September I'd join the team. Oh my goodness. These guys are running five miles and barely breathing, and I'm running half a mile. Just help. They had set their hearts on that cross-country team. I was Johnny come lately. I wasn't committed. It wasn't like Ezra. I didn't decide every day I'll run, I'll get in shape. It was kind of like, i just just doing it. In fact, I soon started saying to people as they noticed I wasn't very good, I said, oh, I'm just getting in shape for basketball. Kind of bought it. It's commitment. This was God's man, it was God's choice. Whether God chose him and then, get, and then Ezra got busy studying, or whether he was busy studying and that made God notice, I'm not sure. But remember this from 1-1 Ezra. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation through his realm and to put it in writing. Ezra, his life, his heart, and commitment was part of God's plan. God's move to return Israel to Jerusalem, not just in the physical sense, but to shore up that which was missing, and that was the spiritual sense. That was going to be Ezra's job. He may not have known it. <clears throat> in chapter 7 of Ezra, verse 27, Ezra speaking, Praise be to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, who has put into the king's heart to bring honor to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem in this way and who has extended his good favor to me before the king and his advisors and all the king's powerful officials. Because the hand of the Lord, my God, was on me, I took courage and gathered leaders from Israel to go up with me. 
And so God, with God leading the king, and God referring Ezra to the king, Ezra made his journey to Jerusalem. He had a lot to do, but unfortunately, he had done some, excuse me, fortunately, he had done some studying. He knew what was out of place, and he corrected it. He appointed priests from the Levite tree, tribe and descendants of Aaron. He set up religious practices and corrected sin in Israel. His God-inspired efforts led Israel to a spiritual restoration and set the stage for the eventual arrival of the Messiah. So what can learning of Israel do to help us in our daily walk with God? First and foremost, we set our hearts on the task. Talked about those words like devoted, preparing the heart, determined, firmly resolved. But setting our hearts on something makes it clear. We know the importance. We know the importance. It's not a resolution. It's not a good idea. It simply is. Think about something you've set your heart on. It becomes a commitment, hopefully a positive thing. And it should be something that will affect you and your family for a very long time, possibly forever. Setting our hearts on the task helps when we run up against troubles. We know what we need and want, and the task is so important, but we keep on going. A couple Wednesdays ago, and you know, I knew John wouldn't be here, because I never made fun of John. And I'm not making fun of him now, but in class, John made a comment. He talked about all of his nuclear fission books. He works out of the plant, nuclear plant. And he was talking about the fact of how he you know, he read those books, and he knows what they say. And I was listening to it, and I thought, that's going to tie in. And as a joke to John, I said, uh, you know, yeah, you may know what it says, but please don't stop reading the books. We didn't want to see a big old orange out there. Learn what you're doing. There's a New Testament give us any direction. Mark 12, 30. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. I think that sums it up. There's not much left. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. All of it. My heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is what it takes to set our heart. Secondly, we must set our hearts to study. And it's not easy in our busy world. Schoolwork, job expectations, kids, pets, kids. Did I say kids? Oh, okay. This, that meeting, or this meeting, that meeting, on the go, and that's okay. But when we set our heart to study, we need to make time, um, set aside a time, and we do just that. Now, you all know who Kyler Murray is, right? Okay. <laughs> Kyler Murray is quarterback for the Cardinals. And in his contract, before he signed the big contract, they had put in a, and you must study, the playbook. Now, I don't know what was going on in the background, and none of us do, but it was a weird thing. But they must have felt Kyler wasn't really getting into the playbook, which in football is kind of important, because they're usually that thick for the quarterback. And you better know those plays. They felt he wasn't. It's important to get in there. So, setting aside an hour a day is great. Slowly, but surely, work your way through a book gaining knowledge versus speed reading. You know, I used to tell people, we were reading the Bible for the year or whatever. I said, yeah, I got it done about September, what I learned. Slow it down. What is God saying? What does God want me to be, to do? So John, still going to pick on John for a while, had to study those fission books. Not fission, but fission, nuclear fission books. He had to know where he read about various situations, so if necessary, he could flip right to the page. The horn's going off, the lights are bleeping, the water's bubbling. Page 43, I think that's on. At least I would hope it did. Committed, learning. 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, 
and who correctly handles the word of truth. It doesn't happen overnight. It does not happen overnight. We need to study. It takes time, dedication. But it leads to the third description we have of Ezra, and that's observance and obedience. Ezra set his heart on observance of the law. He modeled the law in his life. We've all heard the saying, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one. And in reality, we need both. We need to hear them and we need to see them. Those who proclaim God's word need to walk the talk, demonstrate it. Jesus and his apostles did. And there's a good example of dedication. They were dedicated, and Jesus obviously was. If our heart is set on the Lord, his word, we have to demonstrate it in our lives. See, John set his heart on learning that fishing book. He studied, and when he went out to the floor, I'm going to assume, he talked to Amy about this, but I'm going to assume he followed what the book said. John didn't say, well, it says to move this wire over there and that, turn that switch and it'll be, yeah, I don't like that. I'm going to turn the switch and move the wire over there. And do you know what would happen next? Boom. Can't mess around with stuff. A lot of you guys are in dangerous. Gary does electric, electrical work. Gary knows what not to do. Don't stand in a bucket of water while you're fixing that. Okay. John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commands. Keep my commands. Modeling what Jesus has said. So important in our lives. James 1, 22, 25. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forget what he looks like. But whoever looks intently, another one of those set your heart words, intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Don't merely listen, don't merely read, do what it says. Don't deceive yourself. Fourth, to teach, to instruct. It was evident from Ezra's life, his heart was set on God. People knew he was a man of God's word. From studying to his duties as a scribe, to the way he lived, it was all very evident. And so when Ezra came to the people to put things in order, the people were receptive. Now usually somebody from God is not welcome. They gave him a hard time. Eh, who are you? They knew Ezra. They knew what he was like. They knew of his sincerity, of his dedication. And they were willing to listen. Even when he told them of their sin against God. And that sin was, specifically, that the first wave of folks that came into Jerusalem from captivity, they had many, many years, they married outside of the Jewish, uh, outside of God's laws. He didn't want them intermarrying with pagans. They did anyway. It was a sin before God. When Ezra came to them and showed them, talked to them about it, you know what they did? They sent their wives back. It was against God's law. Ezra must have been an incredibly convincing teacher, showing God's word, showing the truth of it, and they followed it. They followed it. The key, though, is, is people recognize Ezra's instruction as the word of God. It wasn't Ezra talking. It was Ezra talking for God. If you go through the New Testament, you're going to see this phrase a lot of times that Jesus will utter. I know what I've, some, and I'm just paraphrasing, I know what I've just said, but it's not me talking, it's my father. Because I don't say anything that he hasn't already said. If 
Jesus was talking for God. It's an interesting thing to think about. Jesus was on earth, but everything he talked about, everything he told us, came from the Father. Had the people not listened and run and, you know, rebelled, one wonders what it might have happened. But I think all one has to do is be reminded of how they got into captivity in the first place. Not listening. Not obeying. Just doing what they wanted to do. They refused to listen to God and to his prophets. So maybe a repeat performance. Let's go back into captivity. Or maybe worse. John has probably had the opportunity to teach or instruct someone in the plant on how to do a particular task. John's heart being set right, his study, his by-the-book actions was what he would teach. Employees could see that and follow the example of teaching from John because he did the same as he instructed. But what if they ignored John? What if they followed their own instruction? Well, he thinks he knows what he's doing, but I know better. I got a friend who told me that if you do this and this, it'll be a lot more effective. Well, if they did that, I guess the best thing they could hope for is they just got fired. Because the implications of somewhere out in a nuclear plant of doing something wrong is a little bit bigger than, you know, most jobs. <clears throat> First Corinthians 4.17 For this reason I have sent you, Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. And that's from Paul to, uh, talking to the Corinthians. James 5, 19, 20. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. The only way you're going to be able to do that is if God's speaking. If from the Bible you can show people. Just to say, and you can say these things are good, don't get me wrong. You know, really miss you, hope you get back to the Lord. But to be able to sit down and talk to somebody and show them from God's word what they need to be doing. Now it's not you talking. It's God talking. Ezra had a huge task in bringing, back, bringing Israel back to God and his word. His pattern for fulfilling the task God had, had for him leaves us with a powerful example. We need to study scripture, we need to practice scripture, and to teach scripture. Ezra was faithful in these things because he set his heart to do them, and he trusted in God. So can we be in Ezra? <laughs> what? I can't be in Ezra. Isn't he like Elijah and, and Elisha and Moses and all those guys? Uh-uh. Because those guys were prophets. Ezra was not. Ezra was a guy. Nowhere in the Bible does it say he was a prophet. He simply took God's word and gave it. He didn't go off in a mountain somewhere to get more information. He had the information. And to kind of back that up, in the book of Ezra, we do see two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, on the scene. So certainly if Ezra was a prophet, he'd have been named as well. But he wasn't. He was a scribe, one who studied, one who copied the scriptures. Sometimes we eh, kind of knock that word scribe. You know, there were the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. Scribes, very simply put, like we just defined earlier, write things down, copy things down. And when you ask them a question, for example, you might ask me a question. My first reaction might be to say, oh, this, that, this, that, this, that, this, that. But a scribe's reaction would be, yes, over in Matthew, chapter 3, verse 10, that would be a scribe's way of teaching. It wasn't the scribe. He was teaching God. One who studied, one who copied. He was a priest. He talked to the people about God from the scriptures. As a scribe, that was all he was to do. Ezra taught from the word. There was nothing new, just renew. 
not sure if this is first Peter or second Peter, but chapter two, verse nine. Peter says, Christians are a royal priesthood. Do you ever think of yourself as a priest? Probably not. The priest doing what God would have us do, following his law, teaching others. So we can be scribes, one who studies, be a priest, one who teaches, one who helps, one who shows the way. We can study, we can know the scripture and be able to teach others from the scriptures. We can correct error with scripture just like Ezra did, but first things first. You see, God needs more Ezra's. You may have been a Christian for a long time, but you might not have studied as much as you should. So my admonition to you is start today. Start today. Set aside half hour, 45 minutes, an hour, and read. Read. Read it slow. Read it with thought. Be a champion of God's word. Or you may not have ever become a Christian. Are you like Ezra, though, ready to set your heart for the Lord? The gospel story is so simple and yet so deep. Jesus came to a sinful world. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Well, let's do some math. All is everything, everyone. There's not a 43 people over there. No, they're cool. All have sinned. Well, if we all have sinned, we might be interested in the next one. God has extended his righteousness to the world through Jesus' death and resurrection. So if you have faith, if you believe in this, you can set your heart for God. Repent of that sin, confess Jesus as the Son of God, and be baptized for forgiveness, for forgiveness of those sins. And then you can begin your walk. Because we're told in Romans, we're raised to a new life. And that new life is for Jesus. So this morning, whatever your needs may be, we invite you to come. If you need prayer, or perhaps you want to become a Christian this morning, we can take, take care of that and help you out as we stand and sing.